Today's episode of WTF is sponsored by Audible. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod to get a free audiobook download. Do it. Lock the gate! <laughs> Are we doing this? Really? Wait for it. Are we doing this? Wait for it. How? What the fuck? WTF. And it's also, ah, what the fuck? What's wrong with me? It's time for WTF. What the fuck? With Mark Marin. Okay, let's do this. How are you, what the fuckers? What the fuck, buddies? What the fuck, ears? What the fuck, Nicks? What the fuck, Stables? What the fuck, Ricans? What the fuck, Amalans? What the fucking... Oh, fuck. All right. Happy New Year. I'm back. I'm back in the garage. For good. For reals. I'm back from Florida. This isn't the New Year. I am Mark Marin. This is WTF. I know it's January 5th. I know I put a show up on January 1st, but I to be honest with you, was elsewhere. Some of you who follow Twitter know I was elsewhere. I was in Florida. I was at my mother's. Uh, I've got no resolutions for you other than to keep on not fucking up, if possible. That's the big uh, resolution for me. And I guess this is old news since it's uh, it's already January 5th. You don't want to hear me reflecting on the New Year's because I should have done that a few days ago. But I'm back. Look, first, Russell Brand is on the show today. I talked to Russell Brand on December 13th, so that's uh, a couple weeks ago before all this, uh, you know, all the events of his current existence went down with his wife and the divorce and this, this causing some, uh, some press and whatnot. But uh, Russell and I had a very candid conversation about a lot of things. Uh, I think you'll be able to appreciate him outside of, of whatever's happening in the tabloids and the press. And I had never talked to him before. And I was fairly new to his comedy, and I have to say it's a lovely conversation. Uh, as uh, a lot of you know, I will be at uh, Wise Guys in Salt Lake City, Utah, January 13th and 14th. I will be at the Laughing Skull Lounge. I want to make sure that this gets out there because I don't know that I've uh, announced it enough. The Laughing Skull Lounge in Atlanta, Georgia, one of my favorite clubs, uh, January 19th through 22nd, if you're down in that area. Come on out and see me. Boston at the Magners Comedy Festival. That will be January 27th for a live stand-up show followed by a live WTF with some great performers. Guys that I started out with, but they were already big guys. I, these are guys I, I opened for. Uh, we've got uh, Frank Santarelli, who I worked with on Short Attention Span Theater. Kenny Rogerson, Tony V, Mike Donovan. Jimmy Tingle, also, if you're a political comedy fan and you're in the New Hampshire area, you're up there for the primaries, I want to, uh, sometimes I'll plug uh, my buddies who, you know, Jimmy Tingle is going to be on the live WTF in Boston on January 27th, but he will be in Concord, New Hampshire at the Concord City Auditorium January 8th. That's Sunday, January 8th, doing Jimmy Tingle's American Dream live on stage and on screen. That's at 4 p.m. January 8th at the Concord City Auditorium in Concord, New Hampshire. Jimmy Tingle, go to jimmytingle.com uh, to get information on that. He's a, he's an everyman political comic and a, a wonderful guy to watch. I recommend that. Look, I know you like buttons. Do you like buttons? I think buttons are back. I, I offer buttons at WTFpod.com. You can get many buttons. You can get the Kiss Cats. You can get My Cats. You can get a WTF button. But I'm going to give you an opportunity to get a collector's item. Okay? If you go to Busy Beaver Buttons, this is a, a button company, and I'm telling you, man, people are wearing fucking buttons again. Get some buttons made. It's fun. It's not that much money. You can get your face on them. You can get your little saying on them. If you think, like, if you want to be the, like, hey, look at my button. That's my hook. That's my saying. Hey, I made you look at the button. You can put that on the button. I don't give a shit what you put on the button, but get some buttons, because I got a special offer from Busy Beaver, uh, Busy Beaver Buttons. Uh, if you use the coupon code WTF, 2012 at checkout on uh, busybeaver.net, uh, you will receive 15% off your button order and a free limited edition WTF button. There's a few of them, and they're cool. That's valid through January 31st. Go to busybeaver.net, order some buttons, get 15% off of your order if you use the uh, coupon code WTF2012, and uh, you will get also that free limited edition WTF button. Come on, buttons! I got a lot of buttons because I, uh, I, you know, because I, I like them and, uh, and Busy Beaver are good. So that's that. Can we do that? Is that good? Let's get to Florida because Florida is, uh, is a unique place. I was in Key West for three days 
and just before uh, the people really started to come in. It's a freak show. It's quaint. It's a little played out, but it still is charming. I would I would have been much better off if it was about 90% less populated. Uh, it was kind of peculiar. We stayed at a small hotel. And uh, there was a weird thing going on at the hotel. There was about, it was about maybe a 10-room hotel. It was an old-style hotel that had been renovated. But there was like a, one dude there. There was a dude that was there by himself, just a heavy set guy with a weird haircut. Almost looked like a, he had his head shaved except for a ponytail, large beard. He kind of drooped around in shorts a bit. And uh, he was making uh, me uncomfortable. I don't I don't know what was going on with him, uh, but it was one of those situations where Jessica and I were walking back to the hotel, and you know uh, we walked down this corridor of rooms, and he was just had his window open. He was just sort of lounging on his bed, looked like he was waiting for something. But you ever focus in on somebody in a situation where where you're at a hotel or you're at some place where you have to stay for a few days, and there's one person uh, in the entire landscape of where you're at that is making you uncomfortable, and yet you have no idea who it is or why or who he is. He's just always there, sort of sitting there you know, by the pool, by himself. You build a life around this guy. For all I know, he could have been a millionaire, but I doubt it, making me very uncomfortable. But that that's neither here nor there. Key West was fine. Ate a lot of good food, but I'll tell you, I went to the Hemingway house. And I'll be honest with you. I know some of you think I'm a, I'm a very well-read guy. I'm, very, I'm a specifically read guy. I read things that, uh, you know, that I've liked over the years, but I never really plowed through Ernest Hemingway. I've read some short stories. I know he's a genius. I know he's, uh, he sort of defined a certain, uh, simple but heroic, uh, you know, masculine literature. I know that he, he fished for big fish and he fought big fights and he killed big animals and he was in a big war and he had manic depression and, and he blew his head off and, you know, he was in and then he was out in terms of, uh, you know, uh, you know, how, you know, how much of a genius he was. I read a couple of short stories. I know William Burroughs liked him. I liked William Burroughs, but I never dug into the, to the, 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 to the Hemingway pile. I'd sort of dismissed him because he seemed like the kind of guy that, you know, I'm not the, I'm not a Hemingway guy. Yeah, I'm not, I'm never going to be that guy. And I know that's ridiculous to compare myself to Hemingway. I'm not talking about in, in style. I'm talking about in, he's a man's man. He kills animals. He eats meat. He goes to war. You know, he fishes for the big fish. I went to his house in Key West, Florida. And when he lived in Key West, he did most of his big books. Yeah, of course, if I had done my research, I would tell you exactly what books those are, but I'm not that kind of guy. He did a lot of big work there, all right? He did big work at the house in Key West, and you can go tour this house. Now, I had no idea what the, what I was expecting. It was a beautiful house. Uh, apparently, his wife or one of his wives at the time did not like ceiling fans and put in a lot of fancy chandeliers. It's definitely a high-end house. Some of the original furniture is there. But what I did not realize is that Ernest Hemingway... At the house right now, there are 44 cats living on the premises, all being taken care of. About half of those cats have six toes. Is that called polydactyl? Uh, six-toed cats everywhere on the Hemingway estate, the Hemingway Museum. And the reason they're there is because Hemingway's cats, one of his original cats, had six toes, and these are all descendants of the original Hemingway cats. What's the point I'm trying to make here? I thought that I had nothing in common with Ernest Hemingway. I thought that him and I were different, fundamentally different people, which we are, different eras, different ages. Obviously, he's a a genius, and I'm just me. He's Ernest Hemingway, for fuck's sake. But did you know he was a cat guy? I did not know that. Did you know that Ernest Hemingway has his own cat ranch or had his own cat ranch and actually had a special watering sink fountain on his property to take care of his cats on his cat ranch? I did not know that. So I go up to his studio, his writing room, which I swear to you is built over a garage. Maybe that's just my memory of it. I know it was just last week, but I know it was out back. It was out back. You had to walk up a flight of stairs. You could only go into it at a time. So in my mind, Ernest Hemingway's studio was in his garage behind his house. Okay? not I'm not saying anything about me. I'm just saying these are things I didn't know about Ernest Hemingway. So you go up there. And you can only, only two people at a time. And you look into the room. They left it all set up. You know, Smith Corona's there, his typewriter. Uh, everything is set up just as it was when he was writing. Obviously, there's no Wi-Fi. That's the difference between him and I. I have Wi-Fi. He did not. I have a computer. He did not. He worked with a typewriter. That amazes me. How the fuck did people work with typewriters? Could you imagine writing anything without the ability to cut and paste or to cut in general or to move things around in chunks? How did these guys, how did their brains work? It's phenomenal. 
it's phenomenal to not edit to literally you had to keep writing on a piece of typing paper and you couldn't stop writing and you had to be very thoughtful about what you wrote obviously there were drafts but unless you wanted to get it all messy with liquid paper that was it or do a bunch of x's through a bunch of chunks you had to you had to have a stream of thought focused there's no going over it and cutting and pasting and removing words and spell check and all that shit you had to be you had to use your own inner computer getting off topic here stood there looking into the study that Ernest Hemingway wrote his greatest novels in, Key West, Florida, at his cat ranch, out in back of his house, above what I believe was a garage, in my memory of last week. Standing there looking into this room, and do you know what I was overcome with? Can I tell you what I was overwhelmed with standing there alone looking in to the room that Ernest Hemingway wrote in, looking at the chair and the table and the typewriter that Ernest Hemingway wrote on and within and, and sitting on. Do you know what I was overwhelmed with in that moment? I'll tell you what. The smell of cat pee. Ernest Hemingway's entire writing room smelled like cat pee, and I'm, I was moved I felt connected in a way that I don't think a lot of people felt connected. I am now going to read Ernest Hemingway because we share cat pee. That's what, that's what brought me to it. I'm finally going to read Ernest Hemingway because I know that we have this common bond of having a cat ranch, of living among cat pee and accepting that. My work will transcend. I will read him and be enriched knowing this. All right, moving on. I get a text from the woman who's watching my house. I'm down in Florida. All it says is something's wrong. Look, if you're going to communicate a problem, I didn't yell at her. I wasn't upset about it. I just called her. But just say what's going on. The possibilities of getting a text like that from somebody who's watching your house, something's wrong. And like in that moment, I'm like, is there a cat issue? Is there a cat sick? Is there a cat dead? Is the house burning down? Did the sewage back up? Is my entire house filled with poop water? Uh, did the, did the defense fall over? Was there an earthquake? Did someone, uh, did a giant step on my car? Is something dead? She said someone broke the windshield. New Year's Day, she came back to the house and the rear windshield was broken. She took pictures of it. There was, it was shattered. There was a hole in it and it it had done that like, (laughs) that cracked thing. So immediately I'm like, who did that? Someone clearly shot out my windshield. This is a message. So I go check my emails. I check any indication that perhaps someone is after me. Someone shot my windshield. That was a fucking bullet. Now I'm paranoid. Now I'm scared. I try not to get her scared. I don't text her back saying, no, something's really wrong now. So I call my insurance, they send a guy over, and this is all before I came, and apparently, it was a bullet. It was a bullet. A bullet went through my rear windshield New Year's Eve. But here's the catch. It was a bullet that some partying Mexicans had shot into the air. That happens in my neighborhood. Mexicans enjoy shooting guns. I'm not saying this in a general way, or, and I'm, I'm not saying all Mexicans. But there are Mexicans in my neighborhood that when there is a, a, a call for fireworks, there will be guns shot into the air. So a bullet went up into the air and then came plummeting down and hit my windshield. I don't know where it was shot from. It was not shot at my car. It was shot at God. It was shot into the air and just by coincidence fell down, came, came hurling down. Can something that small hurl? Shattered my back windshield. What are the odds? I have to go dig the bullet out. It went through the windshield and into the back dashboard thing. I really want that bullet. It's not as interesting as someone actually shooting the car, is it? It's really just bad luck or good luck. It could have gone through someone's skull or on my roof. But then the guy said that there's probably other holes other places because they probably shot a few because you really got to, you know. So now I got to wonder if like I, my roof is riddled with holes. I guess I'll know when... Water starts leaking into the house. God damn it, I've digressed. Happy New Year. Let's talk to Russell Brand.
As you know, folks, sometimes this show is brought to you by Audible. Audible Audible.com. If you go to audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod, you'll get a free audiobook download on me. That's audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod. There's over 100,000 titles to choose from this offer, only good in the U.S. and Canada. But look, I talked about Ernest Hemingway, and man... I don't need to read. I can just go to audible.com and they got like all kinds of stuff. Check this out for whom the bell tolls. They got that by narrated by Campbell Scott, the old man in the sea narrated by Donald Sutherland. The sun also rises. These are all unabridged uh, narrated by William Hurt. Holy man. I got to get this a movable feast. That's James Naughton. These are amazing. These are amazing. So why don't you go get a Hemingway book? I'm going to do it. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod and you get a free one on me. Uh, yeah, just put that in there. Audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod. I think, I don't even know which one to start with. I think I'm going to start with, I'm going to, the sun also rises, William Hurt. I'm getting it. Do I get that deal? I got to look into it. You get a deal. Audiblepodcast.com slash WTF pod. Have a free audiobook download on WTF. Holy shit. Maybe I should get the, uh, the Donald Sutherland, old man in the sea. I don't know. I'll I'll figure it out. Let's get back to the show. Bill I knew in New York. He lived in New York briefly, and um, he was very aggravated with New York. I, it was like a strange window of time. It was probably nineteen eighty nine or ninety. It was before, long before he got sick. Uh, and, uh, he was, I remember, you know, hanging out a bit. We, we hung out and played guitar a bit and, uh, and talked a bit, but the great, the big, great Bill Hicks story that I have is just, um, there used to be a show where, uh, it was at the village gate before it closed, which was a classic New York performance space from back in the day. And the, the show was, it was a, a host, uh, two comics, and an improv group, and the comics did the same amount of time. You know, it was a showcase, 15 minutes each, and the comics were me and Bill. And I get there, and Bill's supposed to go first, and I'm like, fuck, you know, even if you suck, it's going to be horrendous. It's going to be impossible to follow whatever you do to this room. I don't think I said that, but I said, is there any way we could switch? So, you he know, was you... Regarded, uh, he was regarded as great at this point. No, I don't, you know, I, I don't think so. I think it was pre-whatever happened with him in, in, in the UK. Mm. It was not, you, you know, he was... He was still, you know, banging his head against the wall here, as he always did. So it was not, uh, he was definitely regarded as great by comics. Uh, and I don't know what he was thinking he was expecting out of New York. New York didn't really connect with him, uh, because New Yorkers, I don't know. It's not a, a political thing or anything else. It's just if you get up there and you're already angry, their initial reaction is like, well, what's he so mad about? Yeah. They don't, they're not listening. They're just like, I thought we, 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 we're mad. Why is he mad? But uh, but I remember I said, can we switch? He goes, no, I got to meet a guy. I got to play chess. I don't know, something ridiculous. So he goes on stage and I go to the bathroom and I swear to God, I come out of the bathroom and it must have been four minutes that he'd been on stage in front of 400 people. And when I come out, he's crouching, you know, as he did. And he's yelling at a woman in the front row. All, I, I walk into him saying, I'm a fucking poet. I'm a fucking poet. And he stands up and you just hear this woman go, well, then tell us a poem. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, aren't you glad you didn't go first, Marin? <laughs> that was, uh, but he was a sweet guy, you know, he, you know, he's an intense guy. I ran into him in San Francisco too. Did you ever meet him? No. no Did no. you ever go see him? I was, I was 18 when he died. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Like, so like, uh, yeah. So ha- had and- you started doing stand up yet? No. What were you doing at 18? Smoking pot and yeah. waiting to see Bill Hicks. <laughs> like, sort of, like, still, um, still, I left home when I was 16. Yeah. Lost my way, came back home, like, for, like, intermittently would stay at my grandmother's or my mother's. Yeah. They put on, like, I think the, I think the performance that, uh, Tran- was the transitional for the perception of Bill Hicks now yeah. in retrospect although I wouldn't have known this at the time was his revelations performance at the Dominion Theatre London which was a company that's of- right where he came out to fire and he was wearing the hat yes yes right. 
Yeah, like the, yeah, the yeah. lone, yeah. the dark silhouetted sure, figure. Sure, if you're in advertising, kill yourself, that yes, one? Right. Yes, precisely. Yeah. And accompanied by uh, It's Just a Ride documentary, which Channel 4 right. uh, commissioned and made. Um, that was like, that was, I saw that, and it was, but it was shown posthumously as a tribute to him. So right. it was like, I learned of his life After. through his death. Yeah. Yeah, and I just thought, oh my God. Boy. You know, so he was already, because he was already presented with the angelic glow of this sure. man has passed and yeah. behold yeah yeah and yeah like it was yeah the martyr the the, yeah. the myth of and bill hicks so when better to get him because like, that's a whole different perspective because i would never like, i was at that age when i'm highly susceptible to mytho- mythologized martyred figures yes and like that, so yeah, hit me. Yeah, so original because like, well, you feel like you're getting you're getting Jimmy Dean second hand. Sure, you know you're getting Hendrix. Yeah, Jim Morrison, all yeah. of those. They're, they've all they're prescribed. Yeah, yeah. here, here yeah. you go. Here yeah, are your yeah. heroes. Here's yeah. your. Are pop. you a rebel? Here's your list. <laughs> oh, thank God! Right now, I know how to <laughs> yeah, rebel yeah. correctly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because I was rebelling in a way that was very unstructured <laughs> yeah. prior to this. No, you need to structure your rebellion. This is a sort of a template then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you want to do the art rebellion, you've <gasps> got to have these heroes. If you just want to kill yourself, then don't bother with this list <laughs> yeah this is just go straight to the suicide yeah, yeah exactly here's an avant-garde gg allen guy de boer proper yeah. subculture wow i don't know if i want to shit on stage but i like playing with words yeah i'll do that yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have trouble defecating anyway due to some substance issues yeah. that i picked up yeah. i don't know if i'm gonna be able to do that yeah, on yeah. command i can't do the gg allen unless i change my diet and stop <laughs> shooting dope i get it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be difficult. I don't know how he did it, as a matter of fact, because his heroin either. problem wasn't light, was it? But, you know, but also the myth of Gigi Allen is significantly smaller than any of the other people we mentioned. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. I mean, it is a myth primarily based on, he did a shit on stage. Yeah, That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's well, okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to repeat that act or how many people you're going to draw in the big picture. But. It's almost like it was a self-fulfilling revolution. It's not like, and this inspired many <laughs> other people to themselves <laughs> shit on stage. I wonder how many people really cite G.G. Allen as a reference. I don't hear that much. Well, I hear J.G. Ballard, but not G.G. <laughs> G. G. Allen, no. Of the initial uh, geniuses, we yeah. focus on J.G. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, I would say that's better. He's becoming repetitive even with his own initials, yeah. let alone with his act where he shits over everything every right. night. Well, I remember he was alive when I was in New York and I didn't go see him. You know, when I heard what he did, I'm like, I get it. I mean, is it something I really not to be a need to put myself through? You know? What does this guy do? Oh, like he does a shit on stage and cuts himself a bit? Yeah. Okay, yeah, now I've got it. I got it, yeah. I can go. I don't need it. I think I'd like to smell that shit and potentially get a bit of it near my drink that I'm having. Yeah, do they sell it after the show? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Little pieces. <laughs> So now I, uh, I, I went to the show the other night and, uh, you know, I'm familiar with your, your movie work and, uh, and I am, I'm sober myself for about 12 years and you sure. talked I, about, I'm nine today. Con- oh, holy shit. Congratulations. Today. Congratulations. Yeah. Thanks, mate. How's it feel? <laughs> like really mad. Cause like, cause of course, like it's about, I, I, I'm, my actual birthdays i don't like much because yeah. i say oh my god death yeah. it yeah. looms yeah. Yeah. the icy yeah. hand but like sober birthdays mm-hmm. i feel like it's cause for a rather more optimistic reflection you it's pretty feel, uh, amazing yeah because you sort of like your own birthday you can't like it's, your yeah. mum will go well, yeah. i remember then i went to the hospital yeah, 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 but yeah. with this i go fuck me so that was i got the train to go to bury st edmunds i arrived there the night before i'd like to smoke my last rocks done my last little bit of yeah. gear yeah. gone around a few friends houses sentimentally <clears throat> saying goodbye to them self-aggrandizingly <laughs> went home fell asleep on the couch in front of the telly woke up and it was too late to get to the treatment center and i had to make phone calls and sort my life out again you, know? <laughs> you, had, you had to start over again i got one more day <laughs> yeah all right okay i only need the money now right, i gotta oh, get <laughs> why did i make this pact <laughs> yeah um so yeah so it, uh you're 12 huh yeah 12 yeah and uh you know i heard you talking about meditation on stage the other night because i don't um you know i i play a little guitar and i'm still like sh- hopelessly strung out on nicotine lozenges and uh you know i've got my own it seems that you've run the the big buffet of uh whole filling activities mm. uh and yes. you you, ha- you know, do you have recovery and sex addiction too i feel that your recovery with a 12 step program can will apply to any addiction if you sure, use of it course. correctly so right. that's how that's how I've been working it sort of around to anything like food right. or codependency or a- anything. I sort of like, you know, sort of, I'm really like for someone who was like you know, clearly out uh, to become a prescriptive rebel I've, yeah. in, in my recovery. Yeah. It's an area where I really am uh, 
like a little swat, like a little square. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. Just, like, sort of go, right, this is what you're supposed to do. Because I suppose after like a few years, I've really tried doing different things, you know, like the easier, softer way. Right. Uh, how better exemplified than by sort of like just trying to fall into women. Right. You know, like, and I sort of like, the, the thing, the disillusionment that for me that came, Mark, with addiction is like, it's not like, the, you know, it's, the, it's the fact that it stops working. It's like, oh, right, it doesn't work. It's not going to even work anymore. So I know, but if you give it a couple of weeks. Just, just try, <laughs> the, if I just push through this, I'm just going to try one more dose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so now I sort of, like, what I've learned is that 12 step things, you know, particularly like, you know, the spiritual and altruistic elements in the like 11 and 12. Don't right. Sort of work for me. Meditation really works for me. And like, hard as it is and chore that it seems, yeah. when I do things that help others, and it's like the most begrudging and sometimes shallow altruism you'll encounter, someone self-centeredly helping others, like, you know, it sort of works for me. Well, yeah, I, because I think what's weird is, uh, for me, is that, that the, the idea of service or the mm. idea of getting out of yourself to help yeah. other people, a lot of times, because uh, I saw you talk about it on stage a little bit, it's not as self-serving as you think in the sense that if you're just making coffee or sweeping a floor, I mean, even if it's in a meeting situation, you do want a little credit, you know, like, I hey, did the floor, how do you like that chair set up? <laughs> you know, but it's still, it's very small. But I, my curiosity, just from uh, my own experience, because I've been experiencing this late, lately, is that you know, I, my selfishness and my self-centeredness did not enable me to appreciate almost anything that anyone else would do because I resented them. Did you? Were you ever that per? Like, what? What is your specific background? You know, how? What is your particular form of emotional starvation? Have you put that together? I think that I am so endlessly infatuated with my own impression of things that it's made me lack compassion and empathy which is sort of counterintuitive to my nature because i think like <clears throat> one of my mates said that i'm a sort of like almost a, a mythical composition of my parents he said almost like a minotaur or yeah. something he goes got look like because my mum is like this ridiculously gentle compassionate oh hello sort yeah. of but sweet and loving yeah. and giving and my yeah. father was sort of absent he's like a lovely bloke and he's you know got, he's not someone i want a bad mouth but he weren't really around and he's kind of intense so and i sort of feel like i've got like sort of in me like this incredible self-centeredness and pursuit acquisitional attitude like, i just want things i want credibility credit love yeah. sex anything anything give it give it right but like, but like sort of sort of Sometimes inconveniently balanced with, ah, oh, people, beautiful people, yeah. struggling <laughs> to get through, ah. Oh. Isn't it amazing how quickly that can change? <laughs> the, 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 like, there's that, there's that empathy thing that can really happen, and then there's your need thing that can really happen, but then there's a, that also that other thing where you're like, oh, fuck all of them. Yeah, <laughs> that sort of a nihilistic hatred. I always think that, that can th happen in five minutes. <laughs> all three of those. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> like sort of like I have that. The, what about the uh, the Hemingway quote of of his father? He said, "My father was a very sentimental man, yeah. and like all sentimental people, he was also very cruel." Yeah, and I sort of I've uh, went, toyed with that idea, and I sort of thought it's like you know if you're looking at a little cat and sort of, oh mm -hmm. oh you're so beautiful, mm -hmm. you're so perfect, mm -hmm. you little fucking cunt, I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> <laughs> like it's sort of funny because you're so aware of the sweetness of life. Of the beauty that you can sort of like just one psychopathic chromos chromosomic twitch, yeah, and it yeah. can turn you into evil, right? And also, but that's the way kind of the universe works. I mean, it's our responsibility to try to behave properly, I guess, in the mm. face of things. I mean, some things wouldn't even think twice to snap a cat's neck. No, <laughs> <laughs> it's lunch, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's there's, done. there's a time when that would just be normalized, but agricultural, or yeah, even. yeah, yeah. And you're getting rid of a nuisance. I know some people that look at cats the same way they look at rats or rodents, and I, I don't like those people. I have a lot of cats. Yeah, I like them, but you know they are just animals. So what do you, when you grew up, um, what what was the, what was the situation? Because it seems like you, you struggle with just about everything that somebody who's trying to. Uh, to get a handle on shit. I mean, if you, you if you have experience with with food, eating, sex, drugs, and alcohol, I mean, that's it. You <laughs> gambler, are you? Actually, no. Oh, good. Me neither. That's uh, interesting. That was the one that I, I think I it's because there's no object. Yeah, yeah, and it seems crazy to lose money, doesn't it? Yeah. Without any real payoff, maybe a payoff. I think apparently, from what I understand, with gambling addicts, is they like the moment of. Whoa! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're into it, that. Everything's on the line. <laughs> yeah. It's gone just Trapped. because a guy didn't catch a ball. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's I don't. Uh, it's too out of control for me. And abstract. Yes. 
I like that for me, it can't, it's very difficult to ritualize as well. I like the, the addiction and the ritual that comes oh, with yeah, it. And absolutely. the certainty yeah. as well. Of like, oh, ah, yeah. Got yeah. that. Now I'm going to close the door. Good night. Mm. Yeah, right. Exactly. This, I'm going to put this in here or put that in there and I'm going to feel better. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Thank yeah. you very much. So when you were growing up, what was, what was the, the situation that, cause like I always try to track, to track this in my own self. Like I, I've got a pretty good chart over, you know, what, what, you know, why I am like I am. But if there are some some signposts in your background, I mean, did you grow up with both parents in the house? No, just like my. It's pretty bloody obvious, actually. Mine. It's like it's like I grew up with just my mum till I was seven, and my mum got sick a lot. She had cancer three times while yeah. I was growing up. Yeah. And during those times, I had to go and stay with other people, and that didn't work out well. It was sort of like sort of varying degrees of neglect and abuse. Not, not severe, you know. Particularly if you've spent time around people when you hear their life stories, and you go, "Oh, the horror!" Like yeah. the Kenzie and stuff. Yeah. You know, and like I'm um, so you know, but like pretty kind of mm, not good. Yeah. And like sort of, um, my dad was in and out of my life, and glamorous and interesting, and oh yeah. You know, what did he do? He like very. He was always in. Like every time you'd see him, he had a different business and a different woman. Oh, that guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But then they'd be living back at my grandmother's house <laughs> yeah. again. Like sort of, ah, oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> angry yeah. about yeah. it all. Yeah. But still had this allure and was good at sport when he was younger and charismatic. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And in fact, uh, Milos Forman, who was uh, when he was originally going to cast Burt Reynolds in the role of R. P. McMurphy, said that the attribute that of in Cuckoo's Nest said that the attribute that Reynolds had that he thought made him great for the part of R. P. Yeah. McMurphy was cheap charisma oh I interesting thought. yeah and my dad had that he had the cheap charisma <laughs> cheap charisma just sort of like something about him it's like kind of yeah. cool <laughs> right but it's not got class yeah what do you what do you but like when i look at my father now my father's a you know bipolar kind of uh, all about himself kind of guy it's not and very intense and, and prone to rage as well yeah. i mean did you what do you did, did you ever see through the facade what did you see in there like, did, when you really sort of break your, your father down as an intelligent person whose father was absent emotionally and maybe physically, I mean, how, how do you kind of package him? Well, now I think once you've passed through, once you've spent a bit of time in recovery, I think yeah. it's difficult not to think, ah, oh, right, this is a person that probably could have benefited from a program. Of oh, oh so you, you've, you've, you've taken the, uh, the empathetic way. That's good. You, you don't see him like deep, deep down. He's just a needy monster who <laughs> needs to rage to feel like he's he must alive. Be destroyed. Like all monsters, we must go to the heart of the maze. We must kill him. I'll return with my father's head, exactly. drinking the blood. Exactly. <laughs> I think that all father son relationships are, are on some level a, a battle to the death, <laughs> <laughs> which mostly we're going to win. Yeah, I <laughs> hope so. Yeah. If, if biology serves itself properly, yeah. we will. Win. But you left me with those jeans. Damn you! He had one final laugh. Ah, a coronary from beyond the grave, son. There's your gift, your legacy. <laughs> my legacy there, clogging an artery. Now, he left a legacy in my artery. What, my yeah. What about what's this food thing? You've got a food thing. I think anything I could put somewhere, you know, like, so, yeah, so that's sort of under control now. But I just think like, that's why I'm grateful to have a way of living my life that's routine ritual in a way because if i like yeah if i leave food alone i'll start to think yeah food is the answer if i leave sex alone yeah sex is the answer love is the answer there's always something calling your name there's always some yeah some sort of like yeah, that yeah. Uh, what about the uh, like actually unacknowledged poetry of the name of call of duty that game yeah which i've not played i don't either no, well, apparently they shouldn't even. We none of us should be allowed to because apparently they use it to desensitize troops to killing people. That's right. Like, that's that was the the, the uh, inception of that technology was fucking hell. Troops don't like killing people when they're out in these well, wars. Let's make it a game. Yeah. <laughs> make it fun yeah, for yeah, them, and then yeah. they'll kill those people. Yeah, yeah. So like that. That so it's called Call of Duty. Like that, like that. Duty is forever summoning you. I think perhaps you know that that call could be found through food or sex or anything. It, There's just some relentless command of biology. Yeah. Well, what about the uh, this this meditation thing? Because I I've not gotten a handle on that. You How do you go do it, it, Mark? Because I think what it is is it creates a sort of a space in you within which. Look, for temporarily, for those like two 20 minute periods a day, I'm, you know, imagine for you, you're like for, forever firing synaptically. You don't get much freedom from the old thinking. But for me, with the meditation, what the process usually is, is like you sort of, you know, you're given a mantra, you sit down, you breathe a little bit, you sort of go into it with a little intention, right? I'm meditating. We're, um, 
just want to be now, just want to be in this moment, right. and, and, and sort of and have some gratitude and grace yeah. about you. Stay in the, start with the mantra, and then your mind will go, oh, I'm worried about this thing, fuck, I want to do that thing, shit, oh, fuck, you know, like anger will kick off or something, and then you go, oh, yeah, just return to the mantra, just return to the mantra. Normally for me, I think there's 10 minutes where I'm at, at war with my mind trying to impose some narrative, trying to compose some shopping list of requirements, but eventually it relents, and... There's this sort of space opens up in your mind where you were neither thinking, you're in a, you were in, had no desire or fear, and you think, oh my god, I existed then, yeah. but not in relation to anything else. So there is some part of me that is not my desire, that is not my fear, yeah, not it can my just sort of love. be. I can just be on some level, I can, yeah. and that's my natural state. And someone said to me recently that enlightenment is not attained; enlightenment is present. How could it be otherwise? What is enlightenment? It's at the top of a hill somewhere. Of course, it isn't. It's not a product or an object. Enlightenment is present. Remove the obstacles, and enlightenment is all that remains. Nirvana is relentless; is incessant; is already present. Sure. And I sort of feel that through meditation. That's why I think it's a, a worthy pursuit. Because if that's not something that's empirical, yeah. then it's nothing. Right. And then there's also the the manufactured enlightenment of all the other stuff, which is like it, you know drugs, alcohol, yeah. sex. That you want to create that same synaptic buzz. Yeah. But yeah. you're saying that it just it you can just tap into it. It's there anyway. Well, take a few deep breaths and quiet your mind. It's all juice. Yeah, yeah. It's juiced anyway. You're sitting in the middle of it. Yeah. You're sitting in the middle of bliss. The yeah. Fact, you know, yeah. We're diverted because we live in an illusion. Like we we allow ourselves to live in a construct. We've got no choice. That's the context we've been given. Yeah, and and of course, with that's a, a massive distraction from enlightenment. When you see that now, that flash of orgasm or yeah. the gouching out or nodding out on smack. Yeah, really, what you're doing is it's like I'm mean, increasingly thinking of the the you know I've, I've realised Radiohead is a good name for a band in that that there are frequencies of consciousness and you can tune into whatever frequency of consciousness sure. you choose. Sure. But it, that the frequencies are always present. It's not like you know, and the idea of the Jungian unconscious is these things are just there. They're yeah. there. Tune yeah. into them. You can right. tune into if right. you want anger. Right. And desire and right. craving and lust and selfishness, if right. you want. Right. And I think we live in a culture that encourages those sure, ideas. Capitalism has got to be fed. It must. We must feed the beast. Us, absolutely. And it's Every, getting hungrier and weaker somehow. Uh, yeah, everything falls apart if we don't feed that beast. People might have to get to know each other and build some to communities out of caring. Yeah, right. <laughs> can't have that. We'd need a whole other template based <laughs> yeah. on love. Oh yeah, it's a, just a, it's a horrible thing. Ooh. Yeah, it just goes against everything this world has been uh, hypnotized to believe. But absolutely. We, we, <laughs> If we break that spell, Mark, what yeah. on earth is going to happen? I don't know. It might be peace and kindness and people will all get along and we can make our own shirts and, you know, barter. We can't let that happen. <laughs> I don't want to live in a world of bad shirts swapping <laughs> eggs for other things. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, I guess you, that's it. That's what we're fighting against. Well, I, uh, I certainly... It's weird when you mention the word bliss and, and uh, you know, even the simple idea of, of sitting down and, and being quiet for a while. Part of me is like, oh, how can you not just cry? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always the first impulse <laughs> to cry and masturbate yeah. simultaneously yeah, yeah. to lubricate my own penis with tears. Yeah, yeah. But that eventually you tire of that after three when or you four first, orgasms. But when you first started meditating, were you was there that moment? Because I would think that, you know, given what you come from and, and given the emotional needs, I mean, I find that, like, I don't know if it's sobriety or if it's where I'm at right now, but for me to experience feelings like empathy and joy, uh -huh. it, it's unusual, and it feels peculiar to me, right. and, and, my, and my, my heart doesn't quite identify them properly. Like, when I actually have a moment where I feel good about somebody else or I'm proud of somebody else, I literally feel like I want to cry because <laughs> it's not about me. Like Elephant Man. <laughs> Maybe. You're, you're super sensitive, I think, Mark. Uh, like, you know, like in... Elephant Man, because mm -hmm. everyone's been so mean to him mm -hmm. always. As soon as someone's nice, it sort of fucks him up. Because, right. Like, you know, oh, kind. <laughs> yeah. Like, and yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. you're so attuned now yeah. to sort yeah, of even yeah. your own malevolence, which in a, in a sense, cynicism, I've, 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 I've often thought that cynicism is in a way protect, a protective device. Oh, absolutely. That people that are cynical perhaps have the capacity to be more optimistic than Well, they're anybody. hypersensitive. Yeah, yeah no, I'm not going to even entertain that idea. I yeah, couldn't put yeah, the air yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. behind that can only be, I love you. <laughs> I love you. And that is, you know, as witnessed when you do have these moments of empathy that it's like sort of a Gandhi empathy. Do you have that feeling ever? <laughs> yes, I do. And I know what you mean about the, the thing with the tears, mate, is that, that, yeah, that is my first impulse. But like, but there's something beyond that. Like, I'll stop and I'll go, oh, God, it's a bit sad, isn't it, that I can't do whatever I want. Why can't I fuck everybody? Yeah. And then, like, you know, and then I'll go through that and, like, you know, it was a bit hard when I was a little kid. And, oh, is it really going to matter? 
matter if I am famous and if I get whatever I want. What, what does it all mean? But then sort of beyond that, 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 layer after layer of coruscating self-examination reveals blissful nothingness. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think it's, I don't think you can get there through the intellect or the rationale or the overemphasized right. force of logic that right. we're allowed to govern our culture. You're right. You, can, type of you can only emulate plants. <laughs> if you just try and pretend for a while that you're sort of a zucchini, <laughs> yeah. you will cheer up. Yeah, yeah why not? So now what about this, uh, the struggle now that I, I sense, I, I don't know if I can verify. I like what you said at the beginning about I, it, the way I understood it was that you hold on to your perception, uh, despite the fact it may be wrong. And I, I imagine that, that, that applies to people and everything else. Like, uh, I, maybe I misunderstood you, but you said one of your primary difficulties is it, with self-centeredness is that you see the things the way you see them. And and that may not be open for interpretation. It's bloody difficult <clears throat> because, like, don't you sometimes think that you can't even tell? Don't you? you I figure you would get this. Yeah. But sometimes, like, there's no for me. Sometimes I have a sing. Sometimes I have a singular vision. Yeah. And I, people go, "No, Russell, we can't yeah. do that. It's right. insane." Right. And I sort of go, "No, this is because I am brilliant. Right. I uniquely and alone can right. see over the yeah. mountain. Right. Right. Yeah. And then other t- and, and I'm right. I'm right. And mm. then everyone, I force everyone to listen, and they come with me, and it's okay. But other times I say, "No, we must do this," and it's the exact same feeling for me, and I'm completely wrong and it's like you idiot russell you've destroyed this all these people are hurt now and for me there's i can't distinguish between those things so it's a useless intuition i have this useless perspicacity this useless ability this uh, useless visions right of a unlivable future because it's indistinguishable from my most horrible flaws but you're they're they're both your survival mechanisms i mean they're both you know they clearly make you comfortable that these 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 things that you make up or these things that you put all your energy into they serve a purpose i suppose it's a control thing right they are kinds of strategies ultimately aren't they like or even the most sort of painful and reluctantly held thoughts yeah but i get that about people i think i know people i don't know you i never met you but i I, i've had a taste of your public persona you know i've 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 passed judgment on you in the past so you know even even for that you know in my mind i'm like he must be that way so i enter a conversation with people saying now you have to struggle against my interpretation (laughs) of you i defy you to be what i don't think you are here is the object which i have you down as it is a broken hammer there was a moment of climax when this hammer was perfect <laughs> then no, it was where's no the other more. part yeah that, um, there is some pain there so yeah absolutely and there's nothing like a that is a, 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 a an yeah, obelisk of impotence i don't know yes it is i don't know I how they hammer this it. because i you know i need a hammer sometimes and there's one in the shed and then there's that thing that you know if i just if, if it's a little job i can use it yeah <laughs> It's, it's good if you're just tapping in something. It's a, a sad picture. hammer. Yeah, you, you don't want to do any big work with that hammer. No, don't go into war like Thor with yeah. a busted hammer. Now, in, the, in your the, fist. no, you. Well, I mean, isn't that all we all are? I mean, that's why Thor had a good hammer. We can only judge ourselves against the Thor of the myth. We all have broken hammers. He was the platonic ideal. Yeah, He's up there right. with his perfect that's hammer. Right. We've got to deal with this Nothing. splintered bullshit. That's right. Cutting our hands when we're trying yeah. to just bang an attack. We're all just broken hammers. We're just broken hammers. <laughs> the, t- the nickname of the football team, I suppose, is the Hammers. <laughs> As a matter of fact, and they are broken. Are they? Yeah, West Ham. We should add broken to it because I think that'd be the uh, that'd be make them a scrappy bunch of underdogs. (laughs) The broken hammers. Go on, boys. Yeah, let's prove everybody wrong. What about this struggle between you, uh, you as Russell, and you as uh, as uh, on stage Russell? That seems to be. (laughs) Aren't you increasingly finding that you prefer your uh, sort of a performance persona to your actual self? I'm starting to realise that you know, like I was sort of thinking. I want to work on my actual self and yeah. get actual me better. Right. I'm starting to think, fuck actual me. That yeah. guy's a broken hammer. Performance <laughs> me's got a chance. I might just stay on a stage and do interpretive dance, occasionally sleep, and yeah. you know, commit to that guy. Well, I mean, you've had like this tremendous success, because I saw you wrestling with this a little bit. I mean, the whole conceit of the performance the other night was that uh, you know you did a charity performance for a series of charities that yeah. would somehow uh, cleanse your karma uh, as y- in relation to your transgressions relative to what these charities sought to to uh, to fix yeah uh, one of them you know being a, a homeless shelter and I thought your points about animals and people who like animals were kind of uh, 
kind of uh, spot on as as I guess British people say <laughs> with the idea <laughs> yeah. that uh, it's a lot easier to care about animals than it is to deal with the complexities and uh, uh, surprises of uh, broken people. Yeah, we never know if the cat hates us. We no. can only assume that it's being near to us is some sort of affection. Yeah, no, you can only project that. But, you yeah. know, cats, you know, within a couple of weeks, if you're gone, they'll they'll do fine. Yeah, do fine, won't they? That's why I never take my cat on holiday anymore. Did you think- used to travel with your cat? <laughs> <for no reason? laughs> That's, That's not the question I expected <laughs> or prepared for. No, I'm like, yeah, because I love the cat, but yeah. like the cat cares more about its environment Absolutely. than you, doesn't it? I, oh, the, yeah. the cat would stay in the house. Like when you, some people when they move, they leave the cat, don't they? they go, yeah. By the way, you get, you know, this is no, the cabinets, they, these are the drapes, right, and you can have that right, cat. Right. Yeah, you. yeah. You have to keep the cat here. That's the only condition I'll sell you the house. Cat stays with the house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because yeah, the cat don't give. Like, the cat's not going. Hey, hold on, I want to come with you guys. Yeah. that's why they they'd rather be in the box than be out. Like if you take them somewhere, you know, they're like, oh god, what, I don't have any idea what the just, <laughs> oh, no, new shapes. Sure. Where's my path? <laughs> <laughs> smells funny in here. <laughs> that's, that's all you're doing to a cat. It's torture to travel. You used to drag your cat along. I thought that it <laughs> might like it, <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> I've learned the same is true of hats. Tidy yeah. waistcoats. Yeah. Nothing you put on a cat it likes. It no. doesn't like holidays. No. It doesn't like hats. It, it doesn't, doesn't like, like its mouth moved like it's talking no. to you. It doesn't want to play a little yeah. piano. Nope. It just wants you to yeah. give it its food, food and, leave the and rub alone. against you when it needs to. Yeah, on yeah. those rare occasions. Don't mistake that for love. Then that way, yeah, a human being is going to hit you with all sorts of diverse and confusing demands. You have no control a over. A cat's hatred looks the same as a cat's sure. indifference and the same as a cat's yeah. love if it feels anything that compares. Yeah, if it's a good actor. If that cat's a good cat, you're not going to be able to tell any of those things. My cat commits, really. Oh, no, he does. Yeah. In the moment. <laughs> <laughs> but like I, the, the, when I was, uh, when I was watching, there's this, like it seems to me now, I don't know if it's true, because I know that you, when you started doing stand up, were you part of a, a crew? Cause I, I don't know a lot of, uh, UK guys. I, I have interviewed Stuart Lee. Uh, uh, I have interviewed Simon Munnery. Uh, uh, I've interviewed Tim Keats. I've talked, you know, I've been over there a couple of times. They're three of the uh, best stand-ups in the UK currently, I would say. Well, Stuart is like a, you know, a fairly profound dude. And, you know, and he, and I, I, it was like he actually, during our interview, there, there was something he talked about that, you know, has really changed my perception of things uh, around, you know, cause he quit for a while. Yeah. And, uh, it was because, you know, he couldn't deal with the audience's resistance. And at some point when he returned, he realized, you know, very, rightfully so that he's not for everybody and as opposed to get angry at an audience member for not getting him he he feels empathy in the sense of like well I'm, it's not I, this is what i do if you don't like it now it's not going to get any better for you and i'm sorry that this was not the show you expected that's you know in, in, yeah. in his mind as opposed to fuck you how could you not get me and i thought that was a good way to look that at people thing. This is like frank zappa a uh, quote of like, yeah, I'm tired of trying to impress everybody. If you get it or you don't, just fuck That's it. the best way to do it. It's hard though when you're on stage because we have that part of us that's sort of like, oh, but I'm part of all of you. There's that. No- you <laughs> paid your money. You are yeah. entitled to laugh. Come on, just tell me what would make you laugh <laughs> and, and I'll say that. <laughs> I can say it differently. I'll, just spend, I'll do it my way, but you'll get it. Still be for you. Yeah. But but now you've become this... Uh, how, how did you start in stand-up? I mean, did you come up through a... a, a what a, happened was, is actually, I, I feel sort of... <clears throat> what do I feel like? I, I feel like... But don't you think that most comedians must, to some degree, feel that they don't belong to any particular culture or group or, or movement? Yeah, we're gypsies and we're selfish gypsies. <laughs> we're we selfish live out of boxes gypsies. and uh, we take advantage of people. <laughs> so we're slippery, unreliable <laughs> gypsies. Well, I, I feel the same way. And uh, like... <laughs> I am um, first of all like did a thing when I did a thing when I, was, I did a school play like at my regular comprehensive school and thought, oh my god being on this stage is amazing but even like sort of thinking then like it was Bugsy Malone I was playing Fat Sam and I improvised were you fat it. yeah I was a chubby kid yeah well, me too it's horrible right isn't it horrible Ugh. because your adolescence is blighted by that layer of blubber Ugh. preventing you from expressing yeah, yeah. your semen or from yeah yeah from feeling like you can even yeah that, I didn't yeah. feel like I could no I didn't feel I like, certainly not with anyone else there. Well, it sounds like you got your payback. Absolutely. I, yeah, I, I owe that 15-year-old kid. I'm not letting him down. You're getting this. I'm doing this for you. I've been toiling for him. Yeah, He's like yeah, a yeah. plantation owner. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Toiling endlessly yeah. for that 15-year-old boy. Yeah, and at some point, you just got to say, we're done. Listen. All right? Well, I've made up for whatever happened. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> but you got to let this go. I'm tired. I'm in my mid-30s now. I'm married. I'm exhausted. <laughs> this isn't working for either of us. You're not even real yeah, anymore. Yeah, you're Get on your out. own. Right. You're on your own. Go lose some weight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, couldn't it be just that? Simple? Have you ever considered that yeah. it might not be about sex? Yeah. You shouldn't have been so fat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Your mummy's boy. Now get out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you need a little spell in the army. Is what you yeah. need. That's what you do. Enlist that kid. Get him out of your life. Yeah, straighten, straighten him up. up. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Enlisting so, your fat inner child. That's <laughs> my good. fat inner child's going to buck his idea. He don't need love. Yeah. Clip yeah, around yeah. Here. He needs discipline. Yeah, that, oh God, imagine that I become sort of authoritative and conservative, not only to my own children, but to my own <laughs> inner child. Oh, yeah, yeah. You've got to shape those guys. Those are the ones that are dragging you through your shit. Yeah. Those expectations, those unmet needs that our parents gypped us out of, they've, they've wired our brains into adulthood. <laughs> Go out and yeah, sleep yeah, with some more women, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, grow up. Yeah. God damn it, I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you started in in did a school play that was right. just a normal thing, and then like sort of, but like it hit me like an epiphany. Uh, it was an epiphany, I suppose. If it's, it feels that similar to being one. in front of a crowd, religiously, like uh -huh. oh my god, like that's probably the first reliable rush of my life. Really? Like, oh, they like relief. me. Yeah. yeah. I'd never let go of it. Yeah. I, like, sort of. Yeah. I like it was like I grabbed something that night and ha still have it in my the hand. laugh. Yeah, that's was it, it the laugh? Because that's a lighthearted. It's the laugh. Yeah. I think it was the laugh because it was when we came off books. Like, like me and this kid we improvised this thing. I got to spray a soda, like one of those yeah, 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 seltzer things, thing, yeah. in his face, and like but, uh, the uh, laughter of the audience first of all caught me off guard. And I thought, oh my god, they'll keep doing it, and then sort of like a oh, sure. sort of like a delirium, bacchanalian sort of wildness, and was then birthed as a little chubby fifteen-year-old shaman there and then on that stage. Suddenly, it was an altar, and then after the show, girls from another school fancied me. Yeah. I was like that day, like I was in Essex, suburban Essex. It was, I knew nothing. How yeah. show business? Like, yeah. How do you? What do you? I want to do that all the time now. Yeah, That's yeah, my yeah. life now. Yeah. Oh, you have to get this magazine. Look, there's extra work. You know, start doing extra work straight away. Went to a stage school. Got a grant to go into a stage school. Yeah. Went to a stage school. More women. Yeah. Women that didn't know about my past. Yeah. The whole thing was. They didn't know you were fat. I don't know about fat kid yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. He was trying to tell him. Yeah. He used to be fat, you know. You to probably no, he Shut didn't. Up. I'm this now. Yeah, yeah. I know about yeah. George Bernard Shaw. My, my knowledge of him ends at Pygmalion. And okay. the thing that he said about a, uh, a, like a homeless person asked George Bernard Shaw and his companion for some. Uh, like for some money uh, oh George you're ridiculous to give money to that gentleman he probably has more money than you do then let it be on his conscience and not mine ah, as uh, the altruistic sure. bit of George Bernard Shaw uh, another bit of George Bernard Shaw is at the moment uh, at the theatre the trepidation of being in the audience of a theatre the moment that the house lights dim yeah. his friend goes uh, oh this is always my favourite part of the performance George yeah. and George goes mine too will we leave <laughs> <laughs> is this interesting you might be able to, to intellectually hang on this one because I have this concept that because my father was emotionally absent your father was both emotionally absent and physically absent because it seems like you hang you you you, you pick things from different you know uh um people that you respect and, and little moments do you do you feel like you had to sort of construct yourself because of a lack of guidance you know that you yes. know it, it's sort of interesting that you sort of like it's like oh that that'll work that'll yeah. help me get by and look at how yeah. you come to counterculture particularly like even you know, if you're sort of not brought up by hippies or potheads or something how yeah. like where are you gonna get my mum's like a sort of a normal beautiful yeah. incredible modest sort of person and like you know she's liked the Beatles mm -hmm. but she's like you know she's like you know not gonna she's not a person who's gonna go and here look check yeah. out WB Yeats yeah you know, like you sort of got to come to those things yeah. via like eventually like you're, I always think it's what happens is some pop cultural phenomena will drag you in like for me like the Smiths and yeah. Morrissey and oh, yeah? Morrissey yeah. Oscar Wilde and Jimmy Dean and then you're off you interesting know? that so that was your trajectory yeah Morrissey. it was Morrissey to Oscar Wilde to <laughs> Jimmy Dean <laughs> <laughs> that's a good path that was a good path, good you, path you, you, right? it's interesting you have a lot of options with paths I think I I entered through uh I entered through Keith Richards and then Ooh. went through Kerouac to William Burroughs and Ooh. then to Hunter S. Thompson and then, uh, in, and then, you know, I, you know, Ginsburg a bit, but I, I sort of took, I went way back and went to the Beatniks, but I didn't go to Oscar Wilde, but I, I think that might be a cultural thing. Yeah, I think, I guess so, because he's like Sam Shepard I did Irish a little bit. Present. Yeah. If you went straight in there, we've got into them. I got into the Beats and that sort of stuff later and, uh -huh. and they're significant. I got into Iggy Pop much later. Right. That was a mistake. I wish I'd gotten into that earlier, but I don't know what would happen. I think if you, yeah, you don't need to know about Iggy Pop when you're at an age where you could take those kind of drugs. Because he had, look at the man's body. Yeah. He's obviously got a unique constitution where it's right? like vitamin C to him. No kidding. So, okay, so you get this state grant, you go to an art school. I went to, a, I went initially to a sort of a stage school that sort of is primed to churn out the most glistening, shimmering, white teeth, innocuous, kids yeah. like that you know sort of people that populate daytime soap operas and chorus line dancers and were they directly shows. connected with the bbc in some way i mean got, like because it seems like there's a much more intimate media landscape there that if you if you make the grade you're going to be on tv 
There is a bit, but that is, that's not if you sort of fancy yourself as, or, or a beginning at least, have some nascent idea of, of yourself as an anti-hero. Like, right, it's okay sure. if you want to be in a chorus line or sure. if you're sort of pretty enough to be in a right. soap opera. But if you're, it's not good for people that are peculiar. Right. You've got to grow into it then. So I was at that place and sort of just so enamored of it. It was full of incredibly beautiful girls who didn't know how And you were an iconoclast, a self-decided I'm iconoclast. An iconoclast. Right. They, they don't know what iconoclasts are yet. They just know that it ain't everyone else is gay right and i'm not yeah like, so that was like i was off yeah the, 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 yeah and like and then sort of from that place i also became a drug addict or not like you know when how did that start what was the moment who were you uh i was trying to, trying to be i was trying to be this lad danny green's friend danny like there was this couple of there was this group of lads that were a couple of years older than me yeah cooler than sure you know infinite more cooler. rebellious far more they knew yeah. that yeah they'd done the, the, the uh, advanced they had course. the secret books very much oh yeah. my god what is all this yeah. like the first time i sat down to smoke a spliff with danny green he said these things he sat down like i'd bought the weed yeah. i'd gone and got sure. the weed well, that's else. part of it that's, <laughs> that's part of your initiation <laughs> yeah. i've got this thing for you <laughs> yeah uh, he took it <laughs> smell it right come with me he was yeah. from the north yeah. we sat down together he rolled yeah. a spliff effortlessly on his lap we sat in the barbican in london which is yeah. where this school was was near yeah he looked around and he said uh, you see these buildings mate yeah before these buildings were here there was a a drawing on a piece of paper and before that there was a thought in someone's head that means any thought you have you can make real <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God! That was it. <laughs> Are you <laughs> Jesus? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I was just, that's it. I was yeah, signed yeah, yeah. up that day. Yeah. I never stopped. Like that was the, my first joint, and then like I never. I just took drugs every single day from then till I stopped. Like eleven years later. Well, how did you evolve into dope? In a cliched way, which is the, through recreational drug use in a way that if you was to receive a, a pamphlet, so there was from another Fox Danny News, Green. <laughs> like it, there, there's a, a different heroin, Danny, a heroin no, Danny actually, Green. What happened was, is like I smoked like really into weed, then really into acid. Loved acid so yeah. much. Like, oh my god, even my own mind is nonsense. Yeah, you yeah, could, yeah. You could yeah, just yeah. toss that all in Look, the air. Look, I'm invisible. Oh, wow, I can fly. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. All of that stuff went through that in a very cliched way, mm -hmm. and then started to i think return to my ultimate need of drugs as an anesthetic mm -hmm. you know like that sort of like it was never going to be fun for me it, it was always there really as a sort of an a, a, and for an antidote to pain like the reason uh, the first time i took heroin sort of it almost pains me to recount because of the sort of how'd you do it sad lack of call smoked it much more yeah. common in the united kingdom uh, like um it was really sad the yeah. way that I sort of first encountered it. I was uh, in, uh, living by then in Hackney. I was a, a student at a, a cool drama school. By yeah. now, I'd gone to one where it's, oh, this is about sort of crying and being naked right. and stuff, not all that showbiz <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, 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 yeah. So like, I was at that one now, yeah. and I was travelling home through Hackney, kind of a rough area, got off of the train, and there was like, they were like children, 14 year old Turkish boys making a joint yeah. with smack. Yeah. And like, uh, and, went to, and I was really curious. About what are those heroin. kids up to? Yeah. yeah. What are you doing? What is that? Yeah, is that yeah, heroin? Yeah. yeah. They went, yeah, yeah, it is. And they went, sell me some. Yeah. And like one of them, and I hate this when this happens. It was like yeah. five years younger than me, but so much cooler than me. Yeah. One of them goes, uh, I goes, I goes, you know what? They goes, what you got? And I goes, oh, I've got 10 quid. And they, get, they probably sold me like five pounds worth right. for, yeah. for 10 quid. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and when, just as I hand over the money, one of them looked at me like with a Clint Eastwood eye. I went, you ain't done this before, have you? Yeah. Little kid. And I went, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, sort of like yeah. flustered like yeah, Mrs. Yeah, Doubtfire. Yeah, yeah. Popped yeah, it all into my purse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might as well put it into my I've little... I've done other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I had a fight once. You should have seen me. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant to yeah, behold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just went home and like sort of, and didn't really know, had the admin, but sorted out the foil, yeah. had yeah. a vague idea yeah, that I needed yeah. a funnel. Improvised. I improvised. I, I had that. Yeah. I've always been... Did you throw up immediately? No, the first time, no. I yeah. like in how, and like, I couldn't believe how profoundly beautiful it felt. <laughs> like, sort of a wave. That's of, the, the best and the worst thing to happen. Yeah. I like, yeah, ultimately, you, 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 didn't, you didn't even have to throw up and go, like, well, you, you, maybe this isn't for me, or I can get a handle on this. No, right away, you're like, this is it. Oh, my God. And, like, yeah. sort of, like, my girlfriend, it was her apartment, and she was upstairs, yeah. and, like, sort of, just, like, like, sort of smoked it in the bathroom downstairs. I just went, oh, my God. And, like, sort of, beyond orgasm, like, sort yeah. of, the precipice of a beautiful uh, yeah. Yeah, defecation. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just warm and all encompassing and, and absolute it, and, love it, and it wasn't fleeting. It, it held for it a little while. It holds you, doesn't it? Yeah. Hold you means I'm not like crack five uh, seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm back. <laughs> oh, no, I'm yeah, worse yeah, and more nervous yeah, than ever yeah. before. I'm sweating. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I want to keep, let's try it again. Yeah, Perhaps yeah, if yeah, I keep yeah, doing yeah, this yeah, forever, yeah, that's yeah, the solution. Yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, but like, yeah, it held me, it held me, it was beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
and then like you know and then like didn't do it for a while like, you know sort of had a mate that did it occasionally dabble with it so you didn't do it you didn't develop a habit until you not did not that day no yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and then i did when i when i had a, i got a job on him when i got uh i got sort of thrown out of that drama school because the addiction stuff with the, the booze was getting silly and i was yeah. getting they really lionized my behavior this drama school had a, if you were kind of from a, like a a modest background and were kind of talented and a bit naughty. They really lionised yeah, that. Yeah, Very yeah. much a Richard Burton, Peter O'Toole sure, tradition. Sure, yeah. This kid's drunk at school. He's got no shirt on. Yeah, he's good. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, we like him. And he can remember to be or not to be. Mm-hmm. Like, so like so we're like uh, that they line. That was up. it. If you if you could remember your lines and be fucked up, you were you're going to be the 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 star. <laughs> yeah, this kid's got it. <laughs> and like so like you know they loved it for a while, but then eventually like, like the, uh, there was just, like a race between the talent and the addiction, and the addiction won in the end. And, like, you stopped showing up for shit and stopped showing yeah, up. Yeah, got, yeah. I got arrested a couple of times, sort of shoplifting yeah. and stupid things. Like uh, I was playing for pony in the final year, and I stole white mascara to white out a beard. Yeah, and like so I got arrested for that in a sort of in a pharmacy. It was a really sort of silly and humiliating <laughs> thing to get arrested for, and it was sort of put in jail for it. Not drug busts. No, <laughs> ripping off makeup. <laughs> yeah, they said this is it's not an impressive crime <laughs> by any level to play an old. So they man. threw you out. They threw me out with like really near the the, the conclusion, but. but just before the pi- final performance of the final year mm. which is the one that's meant to be the carpet that rolls you out into and now you'll be represented by this agent and now you'll get this contract for this and you I was thrown out at that point and that's when I thought oh fuck this comedy I'm not going to you know I'm through with this because everyone like while I'd been at that drama school people said you should be doing that thing where you talk really quickly and tell people how you feel if only there was some way that you could do that as a job yeah and I was like yeah well you know you yeah. can't can you and, like, and then sort of like me and a mate of mine who was also at the school he he graduated from the school and then as soon as he left we started to do a double act thing my addiction thing yeah. drove that apart but then like the stand up went the thing where there's a real good machine in the UK is for stand up yeah. if you're talented at stand up in the UK they'll get you quick because there's, like, there's talent shows there's real, there's agencies that have affiliations with broadcasters and like you know and own clubs so it's a machine jonglers is that what jonglers it's called jonglers and, and the comedy <coughs> store is there a comedy yes, store yes that's right there's yeah. a comedy store in London and then there's like Avalon which is like a sort of an agency that has a yeah, I know. Them. Company. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and everything and then changes. Show on MTV, and that sort of like the good thing about having that show on MTV is one of the first times in my life I've, where I felt really sort of embraced creatively. Actually, was at MTV. I did this show where I used to they just they, the idea for the show was used to turn up at a nightclub where people were off their faces on pills. And I just go and talk nonsense to them. Sort of, uh, sort of. <laughs> that was the show. Yeah. This was uh, British MTV. British MTV. Yeah. It was just used as interstitials between videos. Okay. Me in a nightclub talking to people that peeled up, and I'd go. Like just bring up some ludicrous hypothetical mor- right. moral situation right. using pop cultural and surreal right. and bizarre references. People loved it. Like yeah. people, you know, like on MTV. It's like and they were interstitial, so it wasn't all hanging on you. You just popped in occasionally, and people were like, "Who's that guy?" Exactly. That right. happened. And right. I was like, and I was, I was at that time was like really nurturing my crack and heroin habit. And like then they gave me like so they gave me like five hundred pounds a show and like commissioned me a run of like twenty. Like I was right, we'll make twenty six of these shows. You get like five hundred pounds a show. And I was like, oh. F- Fucking hell. I'm going to be happy forever. This is it. Yeah, so, yeah. Also, this is the thing that was beautiful, Mark, is that goes, right, uh, so at MTV, you're a presenter now, so yeah. we'll, we'll give you this account for ca- uh, taxi cabs if yeah. you need to come to work. <laughs> for when you come to work, this is your code for taxi cabs, so just say that when you yeah. come to work. I go, what? So hold on, this is like the account for a taxi. Yeah, yeah, yeah for when you come to work. Yeah. Yeah, but... I mean, I've got the number now. Yeah, yeah. yeah but it's for when you can't work. Uh-huh, I true. never went on public transport ever again. <laughs> I went everywhere in those cabs. I had food delivered to my house. I had drugs delivered to my house. I had prostitutes uh, delivered to my house. I had my mum picked up from the airport. Yeah. I like used that thing to. So it was like someone gave me. It was like a yeah, Pandora's box opened. Yeah, it. it was sure. a Faustian pact. I couldn't. I had no control over yeah. using that thing. I drained it. I rinsed it out. Look what MTV did to you. <laughs> <laughs> they made a monster of me, Mark. <laughs> yeah, and then, so in a like, unique way, at least. <laughs> very much. It yeah, didn't sound it. like you had to compromise your disposition much, but Not they very much. certainly aided in your demise. It wasn't a mutation. It was right. just it expediated what was happening. And Did then, you get to the point where you were doing uh, work that you didn't want to do for drug money? Or that you no, were... because I capsized it so quickly. I capsized it so quickly, like because the, the, I had money. I'd never had a money the, the money to support yeah. a proper habit. Once I had the money to support a proper habit, I. Th- it fell away quick. I had a radio show on a cool radio station, XFM. I had that cool yeah. show on MTV. Yeah. They just, everything just fell off me like oh, a yeah. leprosy. Once you, it, <laughs> once you were able away. to feed the monkey, the monkey just was like, yeah, I got you. <laughs> and now look at you. Do show some restraint, monkey. I yeah. don't mind feeding you. There's no oh. restraint. Ah, me and the it. fat kid want payback. <laughs> You're teaming up with the fat 
kid. No, don't trust him. Hey, I'm not sure that fat kid's got our best intentions. Monkey, monkey. Yeah, nope. Him and the fat kid are laughing and skipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that then it was like the, that was a massive rapid descent. I think I like I, I was only able to sustain that level of addiction for like a couple of years. It might have even been and less. When did you hit your? When was the big stride? I mean, were you were you sober for a time when you became the phenomenon, the stand-up phenomenon that you became? Because I remember how many years ago was it that you did the shows at the Roxy? What were your first stateside gigs? That was like four years ago, I think. Five. So you were maybe. sober already. Yeah, absolutely. When you broke yeah. here, nothing happened. Like, oh, I just went downward from that point. F- got forced to go into rehab by yeah. a person. Like, someone took over as my manager and just right. forced me to go into rehabilitation. Right. And then I had a year of being like, came out of rehab with no intention of staying clean at all. Actually, I just thought I'll just do this yeah. long enough to get some more money. And then like, I was a little brittle eggshell man on a bicycle, all thin, only yeah. eating sort of fruit and nuts, and terrified, and just no idea of where to go because I didn't only lose the drugs, but lost my entire identity that I'd been. Oh, that's a good place. Yeah, <laughs> you scrapped it. So, is that when you became vegetarian or no? I was already vegetarian. I right. became vegetarian at fourteen. Morrissey, the Smiths. Okay. So, like, oh, really? That yeah, was it. Took okay. That on. Yeah. And like, but I maintained that even through heroin addiction. But like the, um, but yeah, everything I had nothing. Like I sort of like had to sort of completely. Isn't that weird? Yeah, when you like picture it in your mind, can you feel it again? That weird shakiness of like the, yeah. everything, the vulnerability of and that. In retrospect, though, it never made sense at the time. In retrospect, I. I developed this ludicrous manner of dress i started to wear like sort of eye makeup of my hair in this preposterous buffon loads of jewelry like sort of a glam rock kind so it was of that look. sort of a, a cure ish morrissey thing yeah cure yeah. kind of uh mark bolan yeah, yeah kind of yeah, just yeah, like yeah. sort of like became this glam I suppose, glam i became glam i suppose because of the reaction to mundanity mm-hmm. and a, a sort of a feeling of tedium and fear armored myself in this ridiculous ridiculous outfit yeah but by then everything sort of i had the lexicon by then i had this vocabulary i had the references i'd listen to the music mm-hmm. so like when i got i got a show on the most low rent low fire low cultural thing it was like big brother was a hit reality show in yeah. the uk you know you watch before we stole house. it before you stole it mm-hmm. and i don't think it ever became the phenomenon here in the u.s that it was in the uk in the uk people were fixated on it i'd like there was a spin-off show where people where you would discuss the events of the house with a live audience okay. i did that show and that yeah my it blew up it was just like this thing on a digital tv channel where i talked to the audience about invent events within the house i treated this show with a sort of a combination of uh undue reverence yeah. and complete disregard i yeah. sort of applied to sort of bizarre yeah. analyst yeah, yeah, yeah. analysis to the characters <laughs> yeah. in the house they were just ordinary people uh-huh. but also but i was loving to them and loving to the people in the audience i didn't sort of wasn't cynical and biting about it but i just i'd recognized that it was utterly futile and meaningless right and like so i came at this sort of this low medium yeah. from the perspective of this is all completely futile of course but that's fine yeah. you know and like and, and it people really dug it people dug it and it like sort of really blew up and i got no, radio show offers the stand i'd been doing stand-up that's why i love and the you were stand-up. staying sober Staying sober, yeah, but like in a really lazy sort of way, right. doing the bare minimum. Right. And, you know, women thing, because like, there was no That's longer the brutal up, eggs. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. That was a flood, a deluge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, my God. You like, had the hair. I've got the hair now. Yeah. I've got these references. I've got the jewels. I'm skinny. There's literally no room <laughs> skin. There's no reason not to. <laughs> and I'm not going to stop you. There was like, it was an unbelievable resources met desire yeah, yeah. in a, a hurricane of a decadence. It was because I don't think normally someone that looked how I looked then would have had a background that would have given them some sort of self assurance. Right. I had no self assurance. No, that's so, why you needed the women. I'll take them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You. you know, I wasn't good at football at school or anything yeah. like that. So I'm like, you know, I need this now. I'm mm-hmm. the 15 year old kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tapping yeah. his watch. This you know, is so- my time to shine. <laughs> this is go. our sport. Let's go, fatty. <laughs> <laughs> we found something we're good at. And then I was good at it, actually. Yeah. So that's uh, like, it's, that's was a great blessing for someone who was never good at football or anything to find this physical thing that I thought, like, oh my God, I'm good at this. Yeah, yeah. There were times, there were times in that, in the, before the sexual addiction, as all addiction must, became bleak. There were times where I thought like, I'm like fucking Jagger, man. Yeah. I was like, literally, I'd had this big house in Hampstead all full of beautiful carpets and ornate yeah, yeah, yeah. Turkish oh, and really? rock and stuff. Yeah. yeah. The cat purring yeah, around yeah, me, yeah. seemingly loving me, though we'll never yeah. truly know. Yeah. And like, sort of like, I'd do a gig and four or five women would come back. Yeah. And like, there were times when it wasn't all desperate and ugly. There were times when I was like this representation of pure sure. libertinism yeah. and sexuality. Hey, the, let's do the, this. The, the happy Manson. I'm happy Manson. <laughs> 
before Helter Skelter, before Kill All Pigs, yeah, yeah. I'm Happy Manson. <laughs> yeah. And it was so brilliant. Yeah. It was those nights, like, it's so yeah. hard not to cherish those uh-huh. and crave them. Sure. But I know where they le- le- ended up. I know where they went, you know, but there were t- people like it was, I became this thing women meeting across me that one would leave another one would cut like so f- all the time women in the bed and me like but there'd be crossovers yeah like, you know and they had no problem with each other it was blissful yeah i created this union it was like this revolution from, from nothing when did you know that was over <laughs> too many for like too much um, like people with running mascara people like you know like, like and the crying <laughs> the <laughs> The crying and it was my mascara mark oh my god it's the horror <laughs> yeah people in half fueled baths yes. weeping oh yeah too low for the jacuzzi yeah, yeah. jets to fire another crying woman takes the place of the old crying woman in the bed <laughs> it's time for your stint pass the baton which i'm sure you know is my penis <laughs> weepily taking it in hand and then like a oh the, the desperate awful situation actually like you know sort of yeah, like you sort of, they, they say, if you end, like anything that you're treating, we in that make way, a mess. There are risks. We make a mess. The chaos will come if yeah, I'm and unchecked. I, I, yeah, I imagine that uh, once emotions get invested on the people that you're treating like objects, yeah. it gets a little tedious. Hey, hey, <laughs> I thought you were just sort of like a facilitator for that vagina. Yeah. I didn't realize you had your own agenda, yeah, yeah. needs, emotions, reactions. This is crazy. It's completely out of the plan. You and the vagina and breasts are going to have to leave <laughs> because this is becoming a, a conflict. But if you could leave the breasts and the vagina, Somehow, that'd Is be there fun. some way of doing that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now we're in Angry Manson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the tide has turned. <laughs> well, yeah. it, well, the, it seems that like you know the movies, like everything, like when I watched you the other night, and I don't know how genuine that struggle is, but you know the commentary about about the corporatization of media and the commentary about you know what what it manufactures, you know whether mm. it's MTV or or whatever, uh, you know. I, I, you part you're part of it and you're conscious of that but there there is this sort of thing like well this is fucked but i know i'm part of it so how do you reconcile that is that part of the project now i feel that <clears throat> i feel that i have to be patient around that mark because you know that i'm not ready i have to accept that i still live in it and i don't have the you don't want to stop living in it do you i do but I don't have the resources or the resolve currently. You mean the money to afford what you're living Not in? Not the money, the uh, spiritual strength. To okay, go, oh, okay. I would be probably more happy if I was able to walk away from all this. I don't, yeah, I ain't got that in the bank yet. Mm. I haven't got the strength. To, like, you know, I think, because I know one day, if you keep saying the sort of stuff, like I was saying the other night, someone goes, hold on a minute, but you're like, aren't you a multimillionaire and live in a Hollywood mansion? Right, people will eventually start saying that. And then the next thing I have to be like, okay, I'll leave the Hollywood mansion. And at the moment, I don't have that kind of resolve. But I feel that it is possible to get to a point where I go, oh, yeah, I don't need to live in the Hollywood mansion if you want. I can just live anywhere. Yeah, I think you could, you could do it, you know, in two more movies. Two you- more movies. <laughs> <laughs> Couple, if one really hits, if we get over $100 million with my name above the title... I think I'm essentially <laughs> Jesus. I, yeah, I'm spiritual. That that will <laughs> deliver me. That's it at last. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I notice that, like, there, it's it's interesting when when somebody goes through the struggles that you're going through, and you have, and they're, you know, I'm, obviously they're not debilitating struggles. You've you've <laughs> won some struggles. You're you're sober. You have a certain amount of clarity, and you have self awareness, and and you know this particular one. But it's interesting, like when I watched you performing, there were moments where you were improvising and talking about things that seemed relatively new to you in terms of how you were talking about it. But I don't know your whole. Mm. Oeuvre. But, uh, you know, when you were addressing Fox News or addressing politics or addressing, addressing injustice or Occupy Wall Street, you know, these are, these are topics that are not innately funny. And mm. when you attack them satirically, they, they, they come off as statements. Mm. And then you get this sort of, I know, but there's I know. a moment where, you know, I saw it happen because it's happened to me where you do the, you do the attack and then you're uncomfortable with the fact that you just delivered an applause line <laughs> that was really just a righteous applause line, but not necessarily a funny applause line. And then you go there, yeah, da, 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 da. but, and then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no! Oh, I, I'm not interested. Please don't give me the righteous applause. <laughs> I don't want that. You ruined. You've also ruined my rhythm for a legitimate applause that was coming up for a genuine joke. But there was that moment there where you'd be talking about something that was new and real to you, but then you felt the compulsion to like go back to old Russell. Do, yeah. do you find that happens? I feel that, that that's a much more crafted comedic persona. But like, and again, this is what I mean about not rushing myself because right. that's in a way, if not. Du- duplicitous entirely it's disingenuous for me to say 
I live a spiritual life now. I meditate. I'm still as much defined by my craving for attention as I am for my craving for enlightenment. That's a so, tricky one, isn't it? Yeah. So I've got to present that in a kind of balanced way. Now, the fact is I've been thinking and reading and encountering those kind of experiences. I was first arrested at a sort of a capitalist, mar- anti-capitalist march, not a capitalist march. We need a bit more yeah, capitalism. Yeah, 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 yeah. On, just leave those guys alone. Let them work. Everyone go to work. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Concentrate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, anti-capitalist demonstration yeah. like sort of 11 years ago. Yeah. You know, when I was younger, in the first yeah. flushes of mad drug awareness because of through counterculture. Right. Um, but like it's taken, and I imagine takes, a long while to learn about that and even longer to be able to incorporate it into a set that people are going to find appealing, aren't just going to turn off from. So you're right. It is difficult when people, when you get what you brilliantly described as the righteous applause because I don't want that. That's like, that, are there a better it's, it's qualified? It's weird to take in. Yeah. I don't feel qualified to deliver that. All I feel like I can have is a an interesting and honest comedic voice right. around those subjects. Right. And like so, and, but I can't get to that if there's. That's why I think that room was too big for that kind of material. Mm-hmm. Is what I feel ultimately happened. And there was so much goodwill because of the nature of the sure. event that people have given that time and stuff. Right. You know, like, it was very, very, very beautiful in, in many ways. But in terms of like, as a comedic performance, it was in it was prohibitive because. Mm-hmm. What, there it's was, a big room, yeah, yeah and you, yeah. they have expectations. Yeah, yeah, they have big yeah. room expectations. I've been doing things lately, Mike, where I'm doing like sort of uh, like big, uh, like sort of gigs at casinos, like, it's like five thousand people, and like uh, sort of student gigs, yeah. like, it's five thousand, and I'm like doing things off of bits of paper, you yeah, know, like the, about the you know, minutiae, you know, and like uh, it's again. The same thing, like there's a you know in Steve Martin's book when he goes he re- there's a point where he realised he was just there to host a party yeah. and all that people really want to do go yeah whoa everything's yeah, brilliant yeah 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 and like so and it sort of became frustrating to him so you kind of have to fight yeah fight against that so you're in this active fight against that that's why ways. I don't know if you noticed I re- I started to lean into the paedophilia stuff because I was like this may calm things down a bit if I start Push really it. endorsing paedophilia sure yeah yeah you know, provoke them and then see you know what they'll take yeah, yeah that's I like that I can get you back to a more manageable level sure sure hate me a little bit and then let's start over we'll there start we fresh so that's a reasonable level of applause and laughter that's right right I, I push you away now I'll charm you back to where I want you yeah <laughs> too much here yeah yeah no it's great I mean I, I understand the struggle of course and uh, so what do you um, what now this documentary we're doing here yes it's is okay. it this documentary is, a, and so the content of this interview has been incredibly helpful, obviously, because it's about, I suppose, that process of becoming, like, of like, I always was caught between two things. Like, I really, you know, I wanted success, attention, affection, and I was only that was only salvaged. I was only saved from being the most sort of a, a worthless, glistening reality star myself by the fact that somehow, inherently, I've got this uh, religious regard for stand-up comedy and yeah. love of art you know so like yeah. and that, that you know like i did it for nothing for right. a long while i performed for nothing sure. for ages and ages and ages right. and ages and would have carried on doing it forever right so that and that has provided a neat counterbalance to this kind of rah, this sort of like animalistic craving yeah. for success and yeah. triumph and trinkets you know, that i thank god i was born with that because who knows what i would have become well yeah like yeah you also had the the beautiful con- complete self-sabotaging mechanism that was you know and that's handy. A, it's it's just it's an interesting thing when you get Get big opportunities and you make, you know, what in retrospect might have been compromises, yet you have, you know, as you get older, you get more self-aware and more aware of, of what you want to do in the world. It's how do you navigate, you know, n- not only how you judge yourself, but how other people see you. Yeah. It becomes very tricky to detach from that shit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it really does. And that, that's, you know, that's something I've really, uh, I've only really developed recently. So now I don't engage with like i used to really be interested in google and reviews yeah. and news yeah and i don't look at it anymore oh and i'm so much better for it i have no awareness so let's so when people go oh did you see that thing about you i go oh no yeah it's I'm, better it's better it's, well, all it's that. been a tremendous relief i wish i'd done it before but i'm so self-obsessed it's all it's that difficult. shit's like a speedball you know <laughs> you know I mean? it's like oh a good one a good one. Oh, that sucked right <laughs> but that's really the true one because i feel that way about myself how the fuck did that guy know? oh here's a good one <laughs> <laughs> that chimes very neatly <laughs> with my self-loathing <laughs> he's in there somewhere yeah yeah yeah, yeah. he's working for the fat kid oh christ the uh well i mean so is this uh not, well, it was funny because they came your crew came earlier and i'm like oh. now is this a self-produced documentary because i'm curious about the objectivity of something like that <laughs> <laughs> let's get to the heart of me what do i really mean and what do i mean to others not just what do i think what does everyone else think about how great i am you yeah <laughs> like, it's the this documentary started with 
Albert Mazels. Who I have a poster and, of, give me shelter, shelter right here. Yeah. Him, and Oliver Stone. Yeah. So I thought, this is going to be amazing. They just said, like, do, do you want to, like, so firstly, I met Oliver and he said, do you want to make this documentary? And I'm yeah. like, well, yeah, I'll do anything for you. Sure. You, you, you brought, you're the man that bought me the doors. So yeah. I knew you, Val Kilmer's Jim Morrison before real Jim Morrison. Then, like, you know, and this is Albert Mazels. Oh my God, what, broke yeah. the Beatles over here and give me shelter and food? Like, yeah, Jesus, I'm there. And, like, um, and then sort of as is often the case in these situations, you realise there's a little more distance with those kind of executive producer figures. Yeah. You know, and like, I was given much, yeah. much Aren't you much. going to be my fathers? <laughs> <laughs> I look to you as elders. Yeah, 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 Where yeah. are you? Yeah, exactly. I don't know how to cope. Yeah, I need parenting in the form of a documentary. I thought we had an agreement. <laughs> look, somewhere I've misunderstood this. <laughs> <laughs> this is terrible. I thought we were going to go out to eat. We were going to hang out. You were going to introduce me to people. Oliver, I want to sit on your lap, May. and I want you to tell me that I remind you of Jim Morrison. Yeah, yeah. Go. Yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, so like, uh, when those things didn't happen, it was like, uh, like, also they gave me like, well, what do you want it to be about? Mm -hmm. you know, so like, I was given far too much sort of yeah. rope. You know? <laughs> and, like, so like, uh, and, um, and then eventually, so we just said, well, like, let's just make it about my general disillusionment yeah. of fame. And then we started working with new people. Yeah. And become much more refined and we sort of said well let's put on a gig and the process of putting on uh -huh. that gig and the content of that gig and we'll use some of this other footage because we've been filming like four or five years during which time oh was my like, god <laughs> i know it's exhausting <laughs> i like sort of like, been to like africa and done charity work and felt incredibly like the the, the agonizing futility of that this sort of stand in these wastelands yeah. in kibera and sort of sort of recount a number for yeah. a telephone yeah and, just like, and when your actual feeling is we might as well just give up on humanity. If this is happening yeah, now yeah, in the same the... place where it's Paris Fashion Week, yeah. we might as well just hang ourselves. Yeah. There's, there's no, I don't or, see how much, how many donations. Or go to a runway show. Yeah, actually, that sounds quite cheerful. And there'll, there'll be models there. Oh, yeah, no, I'll go to that. I was going to hang myself. When you tell me about yeah, yeah. bloody hell? Well, I hope it all works out because, you know, usually there's only one way to end this, and that's relapse. But I don't want you to do that. <laughs> <laughs> relapse, of course. Yeah, there's your ending. After all this great work, and he's transcendental, he's spiritual, he's helping people around the world. Where's Russell? Uh-oh. Oh, no. Are those his shoes? Oh, no, no. He's dead. <laughs> It's great talking to you, man. You too, Mark. Thanks, mate. That's it. That's our show. I thought that was a wonderful chat. I, I had a good time with Russell Brand, and I, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please go to WTFPod.com and get some merchandise, kick in a few shekels, find out what episodes are there, uh, where they are, get an app, do whatever you want. Get some buttons, Busy Beaver buttons posters oh you can get my schedule and see where i'm gonna be you can see the get on the mailing list i email every week i write a thing for you people and i don't mean that in a condescending way just coffee.coop of course also available at wtfpod.com pow look out i shit my pants boomer come here and look at this uh january 13th and 14th wise guys salt lake city january 19th through 22nd Laughing Skull Lounge in Atlanta, January 27th, live WTF and a live stand-up show at the Magnus Comedy Festival in Boston, Massachusetts. Thank you for your hanging out. Jesus, I can, I can talk. God damn it. <laughs>